Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Robert Lamb. I am the director of the program on crisis, conflict, and cooperation here at CSIS. Thank you all for coming out today. Um, we're going to be talking about a topic that is discussed less and less in Washington, unfortunately. We're going to be talking about Afghanistan today. Uh, you might have seen this morning that Gallup came out with a poll that shows that the majority of Americans now think that the war in Afghanistan was not worth it um, and that it's not a vital national security interest um, and that they would like us to leave completely and immediately. Um, uh, I recently published a report uh, which we looked out for the next 10 years and speculated about what uh, U.S. policymakers' priorities are going to be over the next 10 years. Um, and um, among our uh, conclusions was that Afghanistan will not be um, among the highest priorities in the region. Um, by contrast to views of the American public and views in Washington are the views in Afghanistan itself of the Afghan people. Um, every country that has successfully recovered from conflict and successfully transformed itself. That happened due to the efforts of the people who live there themselves. And so I am pleased today to be um, uh, hosting the launch of a report um, uh, that talks about Afghan civil society um, and the resource that they provide to their own security in the future and the support that we can provide to them. Uh, before we get to the report launch, um, I am very pleased that we have General John Allen uh, to offer some remarks uh, about Afghanistan. Uh, General Allen, a uh, retired uh, U.S. Marine Corps General, is uh, currently a distinguished fellow at the Brookings Institution in the Center on 21st Century Security and Intelligence. Um, as you all well know, uh, General Allen was the commander of the uh, NATO International Security Assistance Force in Afghanistan. Um, from July 2011 through February 2013. Um, he uh, commanded all U.S. and NATO troops there, um, knows all of the main uh, players in Afghanistan uh, and Pakistan, um, and uh, is clearly an expert on all of these issues. Um, Dr. Hedia Miramadi, um, to, the, um, to the far right there, uh, is the president of the World Organization for Resource Development and Education, or WORD for short. Um, uh, she is a well-regarded expert on violent extremism um, and works domestically and internationally um, uh, to affect that set of issues. Uh, Walid Ziad is uh, the director of the South and Central Asia Projects at WORD, um, completing a PhD in history at Yale University. Um, and is writing a monograph on the early political and economic history of the Pakistan-Afghanistan frontier. Mehreen Farooq is a senior fellow with WORD. Um, she has traveled extensively, extensively across Afghanistan and Pakistan, interviewing hundreds of youth activists, religious scholars, and tribal elders um, to explore the issues that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, General Allen needs to leave at 2 o'clock today, and so um, I uh, am going to turn the podium over to General Allen to offer some thoughts. Um, we uh, will have probably a little bit of time for questions and answers before he has to leave. Uh, and then we'll talk about the, uh, uh, the report. So thank all of you for coming today. Um, and thank you, General Allen. Thank you, Robert. It's, uh, it's great to be with you today. It's, and it's great to share the podium with uh, three very distinguished uh, scholars. And I'd like to uh, offer my sincere congratulations for the the work that you have done, uh, the work that is represented in this report, and uh, I, what I believe will be some very valuable uh, outcomes uh, if we read your uh, recommendations closely and uh, make an effort to, uh, to implement them. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge the Afghans in the audience today. Uh, till I take my last breath, uh, the Afghan people will be a very precious group of people to me. Uh, we served uh, shoulder to shoulder through some very, very tough times. Uh, Afghanistan has paid a great price to be where it is today. Uh, and I just want you to know that at least this Marine and I, thousands and thousands of others like me uh, are with you uh, for the long term. Uh, so it's good to see you here today. Uh, I not long ago had the opportunity. Uh, my headquarters sponsored a number of students uh, at one of the high schools in Kabul. It's a school, it's a co-ed school, and uh, every one of the students goes on to college. It's a really remarkable place. 
and we sponsor a number of, of the students and we brought them to our headquarters and they, um, uh, we, we sought to see how they're doing, to tell us about their aspirations and the things that they would like to accomplish. And on one occasion, they brought me two oil paintings. It's a liberal arts school, very well steeped in the arts. And one of the paintings by a young Afghan gentleman who spoke perfect English uh, was uh, of an Afghan who was asleep. And you, were, you had a, a frontal shot of the, of the face of this young man who was asleep. And there was a chain around his neck. And the chain was fashioned in the number 2014. And you could see into his head the dreams that he was having. And, there was a dream of a man hanging from a gibbet and a woman in a burqa being beaten with a stick uh, and the ruins of buildings. Uh, the other picture was uh, by one of the young ladies who was with us who desires to be a lawyer uh, in her future life. And that painting showed she and two of her classmates uh, in uh, white uh, gowns covered, uh, their faces covered, uncovered uh, in school very clearly enthusiastic about the learning experience that they were having. Uh, and then across the middle of the painting is the number 2014. And then you see her in the lower corner uh, dressed in very dark robes and uh, in dark light, clearly trying to educate herself in the aftermath of 2014. I tell you that story because uh, 2014 is a watershed year uh, for Afghanistan uh, for a whole variety of reasons. Uh, the first is that the election, which is coming, is one of the most important political events uh, that will happen in the modern history of Afghanistan. Uh, it will be the first time where the Afghan uh, military, uh, the Afghan National Security Forces, the police and the army, will have the reach and the scope and the depth necessary to plan and secure uh, this election in ways that we've not seen before. Now, the International Security Assistance Force will be helping but the preponderance of the security of this election will uh, be in the hands of the Afghans. Uh, we will see the transition uh, of the administration that, that will be elected by the from the president who was elected in 2014, in April on the 5th, uh, from the uh, Karzai administration to the first post-Karzai administration in modern Afghanistan. You will see, the, in large measure, uh, the, the drawdown and the departure of the large uh, permanent presence that we had had in Afghanistan for nearly 13 years. Uh, and you will see ultimately the uh, enduring presence force uh, remain in Afghanistan uh, to assist in the continued development of the Afghan national security forces over the long term. It's a critical year. Uh, and there's a lot of concern uh, in Afghanistan uh, about the future. Having had extensive experience with the Afghan National Security Forces and having seen them uh, in action this year in the first year in 2013 uh, of being in the lead operationally for the campaign uh, across the fighting season of 2013 and remain in the lead uh, I can tell you that uh, from our perspective while there is much work still to be done work that we had hoped to do with the enduring presence force in the post 2014 period the Afghan National Security Forces have come a very, very long way. And while in last year's fighting season they took heavy casualties, they were in the lead. Their operations were planned and led by Afghans with our presence as in an advisory capacity largely. And the Afghan people have a great deal to be proud of uh, in what their forces have accomplished. Again, much work still remains to be done. And this is why it's, it's absolutely critical that uh, we are clear about our commitment to Afghanistan in the post-2014 period. The Afghan people deserve that clarity. The Afghan National Security Forces deserve that clarity. The region deserves that clarity, and our allies do as well. And so the post-2014 period, I think, will experience uh, an Afghan National Security Force that Afghanistan has not seen in its modern era. Uh, with uh, the continued presence of the, of the West in general and U.S. forces in particular providing advice and support and continued professionalization to the Afghan National Security Forces, I think we'll see a couple of things occur. Uh, I think we'll see the continued uh, development of the Afghan National Security Forces providing that critical security platform that will be necessary to provide the white space 
for the first post-Karzai political administration to get its legs up under it. It will be in the first year of that administration, and the entire government may not yet have been fully formed by the end of 2014. Having an Afghan National Security Force that is confident in its Western support, confident in its own abilities, which are getting better each and every single day, uh, will provide that security platform necessary to provide that next president uh, and his government the opportunity to come together, to create capacity, and to begin to move uh, to the post-Karzai period. The other really important contribution of the Afghan National Security Forces in creating a security platform, and this is really important, uh, something remarkable happened in Tokyo in 2012. The donors' conference there, my term, the donors' conference in Afghanistan, for Afghanistan in Tokyo 2012, pledged an enormous amount of international uh, foreign direct investment and development money uh, over the period of what the Bonn II conference ultimately called the Decade of Transformation. And so a secure security environment in Afghanistan not only gives us the ability uh, to move to the next level of political capacity and political development, it also creates a sense of confidence inside Afghanistan for the, I think, the very natural entrepreneurial spirit of the Afghan people to catch fire, but also to maintain a close relationship with those elements in the West, uh, those elements in the international organizations that will seek to invest in Afghanistan over the long term. Afghanistan truly has, in my mind, two great natural resources. The first is underground, underground. And we don't know how much the value can be attributed to the natural resources of Afghanistan underground, but it's probably in the trillions with an S. The extractive capacity of Afghanistan's future mining industry is uh, really breathtaking uh, when you think about this, but it will require security to do this. The other great natural resource of Afghanistan, frankly, is the people. And in the aftermath of 9-11, and through the period of time that we have been in the struggle in Afghanistan, a struggle where the West and Afghans were shona ba shona, shoulder to shoulder, bleeding together, sacrificing together. We've delivered Afghanistan to a point today through our joint and our mutually shared sacrifices where a new generation of Afghans ultimately can face the future of Afghanistan with optimism. Optimism they couldn't have ever imagined during the darkness of the Taliban or imagined during the period of the Civil War or during the Soviet War. Now, much work remains to be done, and this is really a very delicate moment in the future of Afghanistan. But I saw the emergence of a young generation of Afghans who are well-educated, they're healthier, they are optimistic about the future, they desire ultimately to bring Afghanistan to a point where it can be not caught in the grindstone between empires, but ultimately defining its own future as a sovereign state. And we've come a great distance in that direction. Uh, and I think the Afghan National Security Forces, if, we're, if we do commit over the long term, and I hope we do, uh, to uh, this Afghan uh, force, can provide the platform for us to be reasonably optimistic that the post-Karzai political administration and the opportunity for Western development money and Western investment to continue uh, will occur. And so I, I offer you that view. Uh, I was there for 19 months, commanded a 50-state coalition and 150,000 uh, coalition forces. Uh, I would remind all of us here that uh, there was a great sacrifice that has been made in, uh, in support of this objective. But we also have to understand the sacrifices that have been made by the Afghans now for generations. And they're just now beginning to see a light at the end of the tunnel. Our continued cooperation, our continued commitment to Afghanistan is not a waste. It is not uh, cutting our losses. It is locking in the gains that have been paid for so enormously and so, um, well, such an enormous cost. And so I'll, I'll end there, Robert, and thank you for the opportunity to share the podium with folks who have made a very important contribution to the discussion. But I'll just end with one point. I, I apologize. Civil society is, in many respects, the future of Afghanistan. Uh, we still suffer in Afghanistan from an absence of subnational governance. And that is to be expected. It isn't something that will come 
quickly and easily. Our own country had difficulties in that regard in our earliest moments. But the work that has been done in Afghanistan over the last 10 years in furthering the rights of women and furthering the opportunity for the organization of women, uh, care and health care, uh, longevity, child uh, morbidity, uh, opportunities for education, the rule of law, uh, religious engagement, all of those things are at a level we could not have imagined before. And that has come as a direct result of the sacrifice of the individual Afghan people and the Afghan National Security Forces supported by the West. And until we are able to develop a comprehensive subnational governance, our continued emphasis on the development of, of uh, civil society in all of its many forms and shapes, I think, will provide the Afghan people who yearn for freedom, who yearn for government, for you who yearn for an opportunity in human rights, I think it will give them that opportunity until Afghanistan's government is more fully developed over time. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, General Allen. Uh, we have about 12 minutes for questions, so I'll ask you to raise your hand if you have a question. Wait for the microphone. Please identify yourself um, and your affiliation. Um, and, and I ask, nay beg, that you keep your question as a brief question and not give a speech so that we can get as many questions as we can on the floor. Um, so we'll begin up front here. Please wait for the microphone. Uh, hello, and thank you all for being here today. Uh, my name is Christine Vargas, and I had the privilege of supporting Women for Afghan Women in the summer of 2011. My question revolves around um, the upcoming election, I have several friends at Democracy International who will be monitoring it. Uh, what kind of tenor uh, are we going to see amongst the population in regards to the election? And feel free to comment as liberally or as narrowly as you wish. And thank you. Okay. And I'm going to take a second question to aggregate them. Um, uh, Shafi Sharifi from Alliance in Support of the Afghan People, a nonprofit agency dedicated to protecting the gains of the Afghan people. My question would be, beyond 2014, if the BSA doesn't happen, how do you see the impact on the Afghan National Security Forces? Thank you, sir. General Allen. Uh, I think in terms of the election, uh, as I mentioned in my comments, the Afghan National Security Forces have reach and depth and capacity that we could not have imagined in the 2009 election. So I think just in terms of the breadth of the country that will be able to vote now, there, there will be uh, a, a greater participation by the Afghan people. Uh, I also think that uh, there is, because President Karzai cannot serve another term, there is pretty significant interest on the part of the Afghan people uh, in participating not just in this democratic process, but also getting on with the building, the building of a democracy. Uh, you know, they really yearn for it. And actually, democracy comes naturally to them. Uh, the tribal council, the concept of the shura, all of those things, I think, uh, in my own experience with uh, Afghans, uh, and, and most recently when I was departing in uh, 2013, they were looking forward to the opportunity for this election. They were concerned about security. I mean, there's still many unknowns about security. I think your average Afghan is really getting uh, excited, maybe an overstatement of the term, but, but is interested in participating in this democratic process as an Afghan citizen in ways we have not seen before, which I think is, is very important. Um, if we don't get the BSA, President Obama has been very clear that uh, he will not leave American troops after uh, Afghanistan, uh, after 2014. The message should be very clear. and I was standing there when he said that twice to President Karzai in a press conference. If the U.S. goes, I think we can be pretty confident that NATO will go. And if the U.S. and NATO goes, I think we can be pretty confident that a, a willingness by the international community uh, to invest in Afghanistan or to commit very scarce, increasingly scarce development dollars to Afghanistan uh, will be chilled dramatically. Um, I think the ANSF is a very well-trained force, relatively speaking, given its, its age. Um, I believe that we will see uh, absent American and Western trainers, I think we will see resources still made available to the ANSF, funding and weapons systems available to them that, we, that were denied ultimately when the Soviet Union collapsed and the funding dried up and that was the beginning of the end of the post-Soviet 
Afghan National Security Force. Uh, <clears throat> so, you know, my sense is, and, and I, I don't know where President Karzai is on this issue at this particular moment, whether he intends to sign the BSA or, as he has said, we'll leave it to his successor. Uh, I think, thankfully, uh, all of his successors, potential successors, seem to be uh, favorably disposed or predisposed uh, to getting on with the signature. Uh, we, within the U.S., are doing all of the contingency planning necessary to be able to deploy rapidly that enduring force if necessary. Now, we reach a point where we can't, uh, but we still have months before that period arrives. So I think absent uh, American or Western presence, two things would occur. We'd probably continue the resourcing of the ANSF, and as necessary, my guess would be, we would bring large numbers of Afghans, Afghan security, army or police personnel out of the country to be trained elsewhere and to be reinserted back into the force. We'll be very innovative to lock in these gains rather than appear to be cutting our losses. Very important questions, though, and thank you. Thanks. Let's t um, I want to take two more questions, please. Uh, start with Doug. And I'll ask again to please keep your questions brief and identify yourself. Hi, Doug Brooks, Afghan American Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I, great comments. I, I agree with you fully on, uh, I think, the uh, military and the police uh, improvement that we've seen. Uh, but the sort of third leg of the triad, of course, is the APPF, the Afghan Public Protection Force. And that's who the private sector relies on for their security. And, and it's a rather unfortunate organization that is definitely not getting any better. Uh, and anybody who's going to invest there needs this, needs better security. And it, it used to be done privately. The APPF seems to be the wrong way to go. Is there any possibility that that will be uh, replaced with the, with the new president. Thanks, Doug. And, uh, let's take one more question um, in the back there. Um, young lady in the middle, please. Hi, Eva Smith. Uh, my question is, how can the U.S. engage uh, c parts of civil society that are tech, uh, traditionally more conservative and do not necessarily align with the interests of the United States but are still important uh, members of civil society and the overall goal of working with these types of groups would help you know, empower civil society. How do we deal with that as the United States? Thank you. Thank you very much. Why don't we leave that to them? Because I think, <laughs> <laughs> I think this very well says it, actually. Um, the, I I'm, I'm guess I'm partially guilty for the APPF. I arrived in Afghanistan about 45 days before I realized if it wasn't up and running, you know, everything shut down. Um, the APPF is, is uh, for those of you who are unaware, President Karzai, I think, properly made the decision that all private security companies had to go away uh, because of concerns of predatory behavior and corruption, that sort of thing. Not all of them were. Some of them were. Uh, some of them, many of them weren't. But the decision was made ultimately to replace them with the Afghan Public Protection Force, which is an entity within the MOI. Uh, and it is a state-owned enterprise, actually. And the intent would be that if you want to do business in Afghanistan, you contract for your site and convoy security through the APPF. Um, Afghanistan still is a state, a nation, uh, where Western bureaucracies are difficult to adapt to, uh, difficult to embrace. And the, the idea of uh, the Afghans uh, within the APPF and the Ministry of Interior uh, being able to write um, industry standard contracts uh, for security was, was frankly very difficult. And, and I provided well over 100 advisors into the APPF to sit right next to the desk with the Afghan to help the process, because the, the, I couldn't stop the clock. It was coming straight at us. The personal private security companies were going out of business. So, so as with all things associated with complicated bureaucratic processes, <clears throat> that, is, that is not an indigenous process with any country, but in this case, Afghanistan, uh, it's going to take time, obviously, to build this kind of efficiency into the contracting process so that it does meet industry standards and those who might do business through the Chamber of Commerce or be interested through the Chamber of Commerce can have a, a level of confidence that the business practice in and of itself is correct. And second, that the, the troops themselves who are securing convoys who are, or are protecting sites, that they are sufficiently well-trained and are professional enough that we can rely on them to provide a level of security. More work still remains to be done. I doubt uh, that we would see a new president change that 
but I wouldn't, given whoever it might be, we might see that uh, you might be open to some number of vetted, uh, secured, bonded private security companies. He might be willing to consider that. But there are still some, I think, if we have diplomats here, private security companies that are protecting diplomatic missions. But those have got to be uh, vetted, they've got to be secure, they've got to be bonded and that sort of thing. So we may see uh, a requirement to do that. But my guess is um, it would be difficult to walk that whole process back. We just need to invest in getting the process right. General Allen, yeah, you have about 30 seconds left before you need to take off. Do you, have you got any final thoughts that you'd like to share with us? Well, again, uh, much work has been done. Uh, much sacrifice ha has been made on the part of both our people, uh, Americans, more broadly the West, uh, and our Afghan, our dear Afghan allies and partners. Um, I remain cautiously optimistic uh, that the, the future is bright for the Afghan people. And when I look into the faces of the young men and women of Afghanistan who, who have emerged in the era since the Taliban, uh, the young girls who are skipping off to school every single day with a backpack on their backs to go to school and to come home and they're being well educated, I, I, it fills me with a level of confidence that frankly I didn't have uh, when I initially arrived in Afghanistan in the July of 11. What changed so dramatically was that the ANSF are embracing the burden of the protection of the people. And when the when Afghan people are protected, they can do remarkable things. And I think uh, if we remain committed, we remain engaged, Afghanistan's trajectory can be up. Uh, if we do not remain engaged, I am uncertain, frankly, about the future. But I will always be with the Afghan people. Thank General you. Allen, it's nice to have you uh, just down the street from us. Um, I appreciate your, uh, your continued dedication to Afghanistan, and thank you very much for coming out today to share your thoughts with us. Honored to be with you. Thank you. As uh, General Allen uh, makes his way out, um, I'll, I'll ask you to respect his time. Um, uh, I would like to invite um, Hedja Mirahmadi, um, who is going to present the, uh, um, I guess, the, the findings and, uh, um, and results of their study on Afghan civil society. Um, and um, I will turn it over to you. Would you like to stand up here? Oh, you, do you want me to? It's well, entirely sure. up to Why you. <laughs> is that where the clicker is, too? That's where the clicker is, too. Yeah, I'm going to give it to her. <laughs> I don't know if I can roll and talk at the same time. So, hello, everyone. Thank, thank you for being here with us today. Thank you, Robert and CSIS, for hosting us. And thanks to General Allen for sharing his comments and his wisdom. Um, I also, uh, so of course, we're all here today because we agree that a secure and prosperous future for Afghanistan is critical, not only for regional stability, but for US national security as well. So over the past 12 years, the US achievements in Afghanistan have been remarkable, as General Allen mentioned, in areas of public health, education, and of course, of women's rights. However, despite investing almost $650 billion, insecurity and terrorism continues to plague the country. As we look at the horizon beyond 2014, the US and the international community will need to find economic and effective ways of containing the growth and militancy in the region, as well as protecting those important development investments that we have made already in the country. Over the past weeks, much of the discussion in DC has focused on the BSA, the Bilateral Security Agreement, and of course, the upcoming presidential elections. And these issues are very important, but what we have to keep in mind is that recruitment into violent extremism is essentially a bottom-up phenomena. Regardless of the number of troops we employ or the outcome of the elections, our investments over the past decade will be jeopardized unless we strengthen local actors and their ability to lead grassroots peace building efforts. Our report, Afghanistan 2014 and Beyond, the role of civil society in peace building and countering violent extremism, suggests that a more robust, focused, civil society engagement strategy is a critical part of Afghanistan's long-term future. 
So having traveled to over 35 cities and villages across Afghanistan, the word research team determined that many Afghan civil society actors have both the will and the fortitude to engage in peace building initiatives. And the even further good news is that we don't have to reinvent the wheel. There are groups on the ground who've already created viable models that we can scale and replicate. Some of those programs have been done with international support, but interestingly, there are many others which collectively represent an untapped reservoir of indigenous talent and resources for combating violence. There are many notable civil society endeavors in Afghanistan, but our, our efforts are focused on those specifically geared to peace building and countering violent extremism. We will outline for you some of the best, best practices to date, the challenges many of them face in programming, and some recommendations for overcoming those challenges. We also explore how the US and the international community can best leverage the efforts of both faith-based and non-faith-based actors and local Afghan organizations. In addition to the report, we have published a directory exclusively for stakeholders, which includes over 100 civil society groups from human rights organizations to madrasa networks with detailed entries on their capacity and geographic scope. So there are several aims to our research. First, let's safeguard our development investments. As coalition forces withdraw, US funded reconstruction projects may become inaccessible for a lot of American officials to safely visit. Therefore, many of the civil society actors, especially in the more remote regions, can be valuable partners for the monitoring and evaluation of US government funded or internationally funded programs. In many parts of Afghanistan, particularly in the rural areas, the central government has limited influence. Instead, it is these local civil society actors, from the social workers to the religious leaders, who are better placed to address the basic needs of their community. Partnering with them would also be a great way to cultivate local support for US government funded initiatives. Second, we wanted to call attention to the capacity of what we call traditional Muslim networks that remain underutilized. Although many US government initiatives have tried to bring in a very diverse group of Afghan participation at the conferences or initiatives, many important civil society actors are still left out. As a recent report by USIP indicates, excluding or limiting civil society input not only rewards groups that use violence or abuse their political influence, it also reduces the public ownership of the peace process and the political will required to implement it. For this reason, our analysis places a lot of emphasis on religious leader engagement. Third, we hope to raise the public profile of effective efforts on the ground and encourage the continued investment in the Afghan people by prioritizing funding to strengthening civil society. We provide some history and context of what has already been done in the field in encountering violent extremism specifically, so program managers had a good starting point for further engagement with these groups. For more in-depth discussion of our findings of our report, I will hand it over to WORDS Director of South and Central Asia Programs, Walid Ziad. <laughs> you also feel you can't roll right. at the same time. <laughs> okay. Something about the two things side by side. Um, thank you very much, um, Bob. Thank you so much for putting this together. It's a real honor uh, to have been there with General Allen uh, uh, at the same podium. Um, this uh, research is part of a regional study which we began in Pakistan in 2010. Uh, over the past two years, we've been conducting field work in Afghanistan, and we traveled to 15 provinces, uh, really in the north from Herat to Badakhshan, uh, in the south, including Uruzgan, and really all the way up to the Torkham border uh, in the east. Um, we met with community activists, uh, religious leaders, and tribal elders with the aim of assessing civil society's potential to A, lead peace-building, non-violent conflict resolution and national reconciliation efforts. Uh, B, promoting democratic ideals and countering radical narratives within a culturally appropriate paradigm, as Hadiyeh was uh, alluding to. And C, administering humanitarian aid and development assistance in conflict areas. Today, there are more than 4,000 700 officially registered civil society organizations operating in Afghanistan. And although the vast majority of them were created within the past decade, 
It's important to note that Afghanistan civil society is by no means a recent construct. Uh, historically, the foundation of Afghan civil society was formed by community-based shuras, which are councils, by jirgas, which are tribal associations of elders, and by traditional Muslim networks, which are comprised of Shia and Sunni scholars and cultural thought leaders, local leaders, who ascribe to one of the classical schools of Islamic jurisprudence. Now, the first phase of secular civil society development uh, began under uh, King Zahir Shah's New Democracy, the 64 Constitution. Um, and concurrently, you had the development of political Islamist organizations, which are very distinct from the mostly apolitical traditional Muslim networks that we just referred to. Um, these were influenced generally by Muslim Brotherhood, Pakistan's Jamaat Islami, etc. Uh, a second wave of secular organizations then emerged in the 1980s and 1990s, um, many of them amongst the diaspora community in places like Peshawar and Pakistan. Uh, the most recent stage uh, has been shaped by organizations created after 2001, including women's interest groups, uh, sports uh, institutes, educational institutions, media, and the list goes on. These organizations form the bulk of those that are currently registered with the, um, uh, with the Afghan government. Of course, there are many more unregistered ones, and they have received considerable international support. Now, you'll note that for the purposes of this research, uh, we've adopted a broad definition of civil society, which includes religious institutions as well as tribal networks, both of which remain understudied. Now, as all of us, uh, I'm sure, know, tribal networks play an essential role, especially in the Pashtun regions. Uh, tribal elders can resolve conflicts between families and tribes, uh, mediate between tribes, the Afghan government, and the Taliban. They can help reintegrate former militants um, and even foster public support for activities from development programs, really all the way to elections that we're seeing now. Despite their pivotal role, many tribal leaders that we interviewed, and this is from Uruzgan all the way up to Kunduz, uh, felt that they were underutilized by the PRTs and the government. Um, I'll give you an example of a tribal elder from the south who, in fact, was a former Mujahideen who had fought uh, beside Ahmed Shah Massoud. Uh, he had mentioned that he had tried to form a council of tribal leaders to provide development agencies with suggestions for projects. but was ultimately denied uh, because it just so happened the provincial power brokers believed the council would have ceded too much authority to tribal structures. Um, this kind of sidelining of tribal elders, which we often see, threatens to disrupt Afghanistan's fragile social structures. The second segment of civil society which deserves further exploration is traditional Muslim networks, which perform three key roles. First, uh, institutions like mosques are powerful communications platforms Using the power of the pulpit, imams can address a range of issues from human rights all the way to corruption and good governance. Uh, second, uh, religious scholars can easily diffuse sources of conflict within their community and even mediate conflict uh, between militants and their communities. Their strength, of course, lies in putting it all within a cultural paradigm that's palatable to local populations. Third, uh, religious leaders are uniquely positioned to mobilize support for post-conflict uh, reconstruction programs. Their institutions can even serve as depots to distribute aid to more insecure regions. As we mentioned earlier, traditional Muslim institutions have for centuries uh, served as a foundation for Afghanistan civil society. And really at their core, they promote social cohesion, quite simply by bringing together communities from diverse ethnic and socioeconomic backgrounds. So what do their institutions look like? Shrines, um, honoring saints and luminaries are amongst the most popular cultural landmarks in Afghanistan today. Uh, every day, thousands of Shia and Sunni pilgrims flock to shrines like mazar sharif Major shrines will host cultural events, um, and some are the few spaces uh, in which women can socialize in the public sphere. Some of the ones we visited, uh, this is outside of Kabul and some of the major cities, um, some of the ones we visited, like Hassan Abdal Vali, which is two hours north of, of Kabul, uh, have appointed days for women, and uh, you'll find several hundred women in attendance at these, uh, uh, at these shrines. As such, they can be important venues to disseminate positive messages and to counter 
narrow exclusionary conceptions of Islam. Uh, they can also serve as sa a safe space where vulnerable segments of the community can seek support. The caretaker of the 11th century pilgrimage site of Khwaja Abdullah Ansari uh, in Herat uh, explained, for example, that when a male member of their community developed a drug addiction, uh, the community provided his wife refuge at the shrine for weeks until he was rehabilitated, and we have many stories like this. Centers for cultural and spiritual development, known as Khanakas, um, host weekly events, uh, they're very popular, uh, which feature meditation or poetry recitations um, or uh, the performance of sacred music. Now, in addition to providing social services and welfare assistance to the poor, Hanukkahs often hold uh, de-radicalization and drug use interventions within their own framework and terminology. A uh, remarkable example I'll share with you, which we recorded from the very historic Maududi Chishti Hanukkah in Herat. Uh, it's very influential across South Asia, historically. Uh, when unemployed youth in Helmand uh, were being recruited by the Taliban, their families requested that this Hanukkah in Herat, which is two provinces away, really one third of the way across the country, conduct an intervention. Uh, within days, the Hanukkah was able to tap into its network and then find employment uh, and financial support for the young men. Uh, madrasas, uh, as I'm sure all of us also know, have traditionally been the primary vehicle for religious education in Afghanistan. Uh, as of 2011, there were approximately 700 registered madrasas, but there are thousands that remain unregistered with crumbling infrastructure in many cases. Now, teachers are very concerned, and this is something that we heard across the board, um, that some communities may accept funds from abroad uh, to build up their schools, and this may and has been in some cases, changed the ideological landscape of Afghanistan. Uh, Kunar province, uh, Nuristan, both of them are very uh, well-known cases where foreign funding has increased uh, takfirism. And this is the belief that someone who does not ascribe to a particular uh, um, form of Islam is outside the pale of the religion and in the worst case, vajib uh, al-qatal or worthy of being killed. So while traditional Muslim networks offer many opportunities, there are um, four key challenges amongst, of course, many others uh, that they face, which we really should keep in mind in developing an engagement strategy going forward. And this addresses a, a question, starts to address a question that we had earlier on. Uh, first of all, Afghan traditional Muslim leaders are not as well networked as their counterparts in other Muslim countries. Uh, for example, just across the border in Pakistan, um, religious institutions will coordinate resources amongst their affiliated soup kitchens, madrasas, welfare organizations, um, et cetera, political parties, and and list goes on. Um, next, during the Soviet occupation, many networks were dismantled. Uh, scholars were killed, tortured, or exiled. Many Hanukkahs were destroyed, while libraries and cultural landmarks uh, became derelict. And then many uh, vaqfs, which are charitable endowments that sustain some of these institutions, were also dissolved. So today, many communities have to rely on meager local donations. Then, this is a very important point, but given social norms, we cannot expect traditional Muslim leaders to see eye to eye with us on sensitive issues, for example, like women's role in the public sphere. Um, instead, we have to find areas that we do agree on, like national reconciliation or women's education. And there are numerous traditional madrasas which have uh, women's branches with hundreds of women's in attendance that we had the fortune of visiting. Um, and then once we, once we address these issues, then we can move on to more sensitive issues after building trust. The other challenge comes from violent extremists who have recently targeted traditional Muslim networks, uh, denounced cultural practices, and have physically assaulted pilgrims at shrines. Uh, there are a handful of responses to this. Uh, scholars from northwestern Afghanistan, for example, have formed the Shurai Matasawifin, which is a council of 50 prominent personalities and thought leaders uh, who aim to organize events to preserve uh, authentic Afghan culture and spirituality and to raise awareness about the issue of violent extremism. Um, now, historically, the religious landscape of Afghanistan was a fluid mix of local Islamic practices um, and tribal customs, which were shaped in many ways by these traditional Muslim networks that we're discussing. Um, but by the 70s, uh, like in um, other countries, Egypt and South Asia, political Islamism uh, began to appeal to uh, disenfranchised urban middle classes and others. 
And the story of Afghanistan's Ikhwani parties, uh, as they're referred to during the Soviet war, um, is probably familiar to most of us, so won't get into details. And probably most of us are also familiar with the violence and human rights abuses uh, that many groups were engaged in in the Civil War period. Uh, these uh, um, Islamists, these Ikhwani parties, have uh, recently reemerged in interesting flavors. Um, a familiar example is Hizb Islami. I'm sure many of us have heard of, of what's happened in this case, where you have one faction that's uh, joined the government and adopted uh, very progressive stances, such as women's education, and then another will fuel militant opposition. Uh, today, there's a prevalent concern that if uh, some of these groups come to power, they may abandon some of their progressive uh, rhetoric on democracy and human rights, but the verdict is still out. Now, with that overview of the actors, uh, we'll now look at peace building and CVE initiatives carried out by local organizations. We'll give you a glimpse of the broad range of methods and channels that have been used, um, some of them very innovative. Um, particularly how indigenous tools and resources are employed. We'll begin with programs to prevent sectarianism, which many Afghan community leaders fear could fuel further violence um, as it has in Iraq and Syria. Uh, one of the popular nationwide responses uh, came from scholars who formed a council of over 100 uh, well-respected Sunni and Shia leaders known as the Islamic Brotherhood Council. Members issue public statements or organize small demonstrations of social solidarity. And I'll give you an example. Um, some of us may remember this. Uh, when the revered Shia cultural landmark honoring Hazrat Abul Fazal Abbas uh, was attacked in 2012, the council pledged their support to the Shia community. Other initiatives are less institutionalized. Uh, for example, in Kabul, religious scholars and academics and radio personalities will convene at Hazrat Amin Saib Ansari, which is also a major pilgrimage site, uh, to discuss how to disseminate messages of tolerance within Friday sermons and on other public platforms. Uh, conflict resolution is another key type of CVE program because local and uh, land disputes or tribal disputes often feed militancy if left unresolved. Uh, these types of disputes were traditionally handled by councils of community leaders or elders. One particularly uh, effective example of how this traditional mechanism can be scaled up comes from Herat, where hundreds of imams congregate at the Jami Mosque to resolve community concerns. And what's remarkable about this, uh, uh, this program is that you often have these programs televised and local scholars who are participating will take lessons learned to their particular communities. Uh, there are sever several secular organizations funded by USIP, USAID, like PTRO and Kapow, which have also designed excellent uh, peace and conflict resolution trainings to bolster these kinds of grassroots mediation efforts. Social welfare assistance uh, to at-risk communities is a very important part of a holistic CVE strategy, and this is really to counter this Hezbollah-type strategy of providing aid in order to win recruits. Uh, there are dozens of Afghan CSOs, uh, from Sinai development all the way to the local ones like uh, Kabul's Hazratu Shamshire Khaniqa, uh, that will provide food and humanitarian assistance to thousands. However, most uh, grassroots initiatives are not institutionalized, um, and more sustainable efforts are required to target communities that are particularly being courted by militants. CSOs are also developing innovative initiatives from public murals to uh, street theater to address issues of drug abuse and small arms prol proliferation, uh, both of which fuel militancy. Uh, radio public awareness campaigns have also been developed by Radio Khalid uh, and others to inform the communities at the uh, national or at regional levels. But you also have grassroots organizations like the Nangarhar-based Association for Solving Community Problems. Uh, that's developed door-to-door -door arms reduction campaigns. Now, we noted in this case that um, personalized interventions at religious institutions were particularly effective. In Jalalabad, for example, uh, Molvi Najibullah uh, brings together local imams, community leaders, and youth activists to develop collective solutions. Uh, for drug users, they'll arrange rehabilitation programs, again, to the best of their ability. And for arms dealers, they will offer alternative employment. 
If the initial uh, intervention fails, the team then invites a large group of scholars in who then literally bombard them with theological arguments. Um, and if all else fails, then they'll turn to local government officials. Poetry remains uh, one of the most powerful mediums of communication and social commentary in Afghanistan. Uh, anyone who's taken a local taxi in Mazar Sharif, for example, will know that even cab drivers use classical poetry in political critiques. Um, it's very common everywhere. Uh, across the country, communities are organizing public events to explore principles of tolerance in the works of Afghanistan's native famed poets, uh, notably Molana Rumi Balkhi. Uh, and these are instrumental in developing positive narratives that change intolerant ideologies. And then you have organizations like the Foundation uh, for Culture and Civil Society, which organize poetry recitals and Qawwali musical performances on a very large scale, which were previously banned under the Taliban. Uh, so now, Mehreen, um, I'll turn it over to you. I believe you'll discuss some of the best practices and recommendations. I think it's probably best I sit and man the mouse since that's my <laughs> official role today. Um, Don't trust me with the mouse. No. <laughs> yeah, that's the real test. So. <clears throat> okay, so there are several uh, channels in Afghanistan through which uh, community groups are disseminating messages to promote good governance, anti-corruption, human rights, women's education, all of these issues which end up building resilience against armed opposition groups. The first are religious institutions, which Waleed had spoken uh, extensively on. Now, to better disseminate information about these key issues in mosques and madrasas, there are several notable religious leader training programs, such as uh, Jamila Afghani's well-known uh, training program on women's rights. Uh, the second channel is the media. While many of us are familiar with Afghan TV programs that promote democracy, it's really Afghanistan's over 150 radio stations, which are playing an important role, particularly in uh, rural areas. Organizations such as Equal Access have developed radio dramas in partnership with local religious scholars, framing peace building within a cultural context. And finally, there's a number of alternative channels. Uh, the grassroots youth theater Jalalabad, for example, uses street theater to promote nonviolent conflict resolution. So let's say if there's a, a conflict over water rights, the organization will perform a play, um, and then they engage the audience in a live discussion as to um, how they would resolve the issue within their community. Now, in our fieldwork, we identified numerous best practices. For instance, we found that programs were most successful when they used a culturally appropriate framework to address sensitive social issues. In fact, it's noteworthy that the Afghanistan uh, branch of Planned Parenthood, yes, there is one there, uh, has addressed reproductive health issues for nearly four decades by engaging these issues within an Islamic framework. Still, there is a concern that uh, civil society is a foreign construct and uh, is sort of created um, by foreign uh, actors to undermine Islamic principles. So to maintain credibility, even some secular organizations have created partnerships with religious scholars to publicly sanction their work. In fact, USAID had also done something similar by airing public service announcements which had involved religious scholars in, uh, to discuss about the importance of civil society. Second, programs tend to be successful when local communities had the ownership of the initiative. Several of the uh, programs we studied were funded by the US government, but interestingly, none were branded as such and appear to be completely locally driven. Third, many organizations only uh, tend to go through the Ministry of Hajj and Religious Affairs to identify religious leaders to work with. Um, and we found that uh, initiatives tend to get the most reach when they go beyond these state networks. So individuals associated with state-linked uh, madrasas or mosques, even the High Peace Council, tend to have limited uh, credibility, especially, again, in the rural areas. So while engaging these groups can't be avoided, it's important to keep in mind that amongst Afghans, there is a distinction between mullah darbari, or the state religious officials, and the more trusted local religious leaders. Additionally, Islamist groups that were implicated in the crimes of the Civil War and the Taliban era are similarly tainted in the public eye. Fourth, we found that counter-narratives resonated strongest 
when they were supported by renowned international religious scholars. Two years ago, Word co-sponsored conferences with George Mason and Boston University, which had networked over 200 Afghan religious leaders with international scholars, big names like Dr. Tahir al-Qadri, Sheikh Ali Goma of Egypt, the head mufti of Bosnia, and so on, all whom Word had invited. During the conferences, the participants developed a fatwa against terrorism and suicide bombing. Now, interestingly, for security purposes, when the fatwa was aired on the radio, the names of the local actors had actually been omitted. But many of the civil society groups that we met with still cited the fatwa because of the authoritative weight of the international figures associated with it. In fact, while many faith-based networks we met with were hesitant to engage with foreign governments di directly, they specifically requested that organizations like Word engage them given their respect for the scholars in our networks. Finally, we found that involving local civil society organizations in peace building tends to be successful once trust uh, that once we've fostered trust building and once we've met the basic needs of the community. Even simple roads and wells, which uh, we have invested uh, quite a bit of money in, uh, can be inexpensive, relatively speaking, and can go a long way in terms of buying community support. So there are several challenges that civil society activists continuously highlighted in our research. Security, of course, has prevented uh, project implementation and monitoring, and has also made it difficult for locals to organize public awareness campaigns uh, about extremism. In fact, if the BSA remains unsigned uh, and the US were to pursue something close to the zero option, this could significantly jeopardize new efforts on the ground. In addition, talking about militancy and Talibanization in Afghanistan is a delicate issue because there is no real consensus on who the enemy is. Uh, there's much confusion as to who's behind attacks, who's linked to whom. And essentially, our research indicates that violent extremism, um, sorry, violent anti-state activism has taken a uh, variety of forms. So of course we have the Taliban, which are quite decentralized. Um, then you have independent militias, foreign-based militant groups. And then you have the militant Islamists, like Hizb Islami Gulbuddin who, as we know, recently coordinated the attack in Kabul, which had killed 13 foreigners. And finally, there are the nonviolent extremists that espouse an intolerant interpretation of sacred texts that foment ethnic or sectarian conflict. So in short, due to the myriad of actors, it's difficult for activists to develop counter narratives. Despite these complications, there is at least a consensus that um, groups killing civilians, trying to create ethnic discord, and those who are engaging in takfir, particularly pitting Shias against Sunnis, uh, that these issues can be starting points to frame narratives ag against extremism. Media and communication networks also remain underdeveloped throughout the country, so there are fewer opportunities for organizations to speak out. And there's also significant misconceptions of civil society objectives, despite some of the initiatives I highlighted earlier. Corruption and nepotism uh, are also cited as significant problems. Um, another common complaint is that the international community is still uh, limited uh, largely uh, to engaging with English-speaking, Kabul-based civil society activists. Financial viability is, of course, a chief concern. Many registered CSOs are reliant on international funding, and many have developed donor dependency. Um, and if funding were to be significantly cut, it could have a very drastic impact on uh, Afghanistan civil society. We're likely to see uh, a high increase in unemployment, particularly amongst youth, as well as fewer peaceful outlets for um, people to uh, air their political and social grievances. Finally, the vast majority of Afghan CSOs still lack institutional capacity. Addressing this will take time, and activists suggested that programs like the One Mandi uh, and USAID's uh, initiative to promote Afghan civil society, that these are great programs that should be continued. So what are our next steps? Our interviews offered a number of recommendations specifically for peace building and encountering violent extremism. First, groups recommended that we go local by engaging community leaders in peace building initiatives. This is something that development experts noted worked really well uh, with funding community development councils or CDCs. So basically for any local scheme like an irrigation project, the government would provide a certain percentage of funding and the community would have to raise the rest. So you had uh, imams fundraising on the pulpit and tribal leaders in their public gatherings. 
according to one of the development experts that we had interviewed who had been monitoring these programs, these projects also help offset radicalization. Interesting connection. Because people want to retain ownership of the projects and don't want to succeed the authority to the extremists. Secondly, activists suggested that we go rural. So currently, the debate on Afghanistan's future has generally uh, been limited to Kabul's urban elite. We can encourage the development of neutral, apolitical third spaces like universities that can bring together local civil society activists to contribute to the discussion on Afghanistan's future. In addition, we need more civil society leaders outside of their urban centers to participate in major state building conferences and discussions. Something again to keep in mind if there is another Tokyo or Bonn conference. Third, it's important to diversify religious engagement to include apolitical, traditional Muslim groups that have the grassroots credibility and which are not associated with earlier war crimes. Finally, youth should be included in all aspects of peace building. This is a particularly important reminder considering that 68% of the population is below the age of 25. So in expanding our base of partners, more refined screening processes will naturally be required which take into account organization and individuals' past history. Participants should be sought out who have consistently denounced terrorism, suicide bombing, anti-state activities. As we mentioned earlier, we may not always see eye to eye with these groups, but it's important to at least identify those who um, ascribe to shared values. And in working with former militants, extra vigilance will be required um, to make sure that they don't say one thing publicly and another thing privately. In fact, one of our interviews with an international NGO after um, a long discussion with an aid worker about religious leader engagement in public health issues, um, we were really surprised when he turned around and told us how happy he was to meet young Muslims working on these issues. And he re recommended that when we return to the US that we could set up a Muslim organization like Al-Qaeda, <laughs> the same way the great Sheikh Osama did. So as you can imagine, we were quite shocked that someone with such extremist views was working openly with a, a, a well-respected um, international organization. Needless to say, we ended that interview quickly. So all this, of course, requires that our cultural competency training efforts, like the excellent AFPAC Hands programs and others, need to be scaled up. Afghan community leaders uh, agree that if more uh, foreign personnel had received such training, it could have reduced cultural offenses, could have reduced distrust, and even green on blue attacks. Furthermore, we should have training modules on identifying radical ideologies and the roots of violent extremism so that officials that are engaged in outreach can better identify partners. Our report also goes into some detail regarding international efforts to engage civil society groups. So from IVLP exchanges that are organized through the State Department to capacity building and imam training programs, now, while these efforts have been very well received, we need to develop follow-up initiatives, starting perhaps with the graduates of these programs, to really forge a network of peace builders who can ultimately develop national campaigns. One area which will require special attention will be networking between faith-based and the secular organizations, which to date uh, rarely collaborate. Finally, community leaders constantly ask that Afghan, Afghanistan civil society be networked with their international counterparts, particularly from countries like Indonesia, Turkey, Pakistan, all of which are facing similar issues of uh, either insurgencies or violent extremism. So civil society organizations still need institutional capacity development. The most common needs expressed to us are listed here. Um, and I'd just like to stress that training should also include guidance on becoming eligible for funding from international donors, particularly as we move forward. One of the main impediments uh, for local organizations to access international funding is the size of grants. Smaller organizations, which are based out of Kabul, said that they tend to lack the capacity to carry out larger projects or simply to even compete with um, bigger organizations. They said that they would prefer to have microgrants, which could be better managed and less susceptible to corruption. And they also recommended reducing complicated reporting requirements, extending grant durations beyond one to two years, and even expediting grant allocations. And finally, given the quick turnover of US government staff in Kabul, we need mechanisms to ensure continuous engagement with civil society actors that we have been working with. Despite the difficulties of the past 12 years, there are a host of organizations that are still interested in receiving support from the international community. 
as we mentioned, many of the groups we met with insisted that we work with them. So I'll just end here uh, and add that we encourage policymakers and the community here to refer to our, uh, our resources. And um, ultimately, we hope that this can help foster increased civil society engagements beyond 2014. Great. Thank you very much. Um, uh, while all of you are formulating your questions or figuring out how to make them more concise, um, I will um, uh, begin just by throwing out there what, um, uh, what do you foresee, given, uh, given the um, American public attitudes, um, given the, the, political, um, uh, the political will that's been declining pretty rapidly in Washington, um, the strong likelihood that attention is going to continue to wane. Um, uh, from the international community in Afghanistan over the next few years. Um, could you spell out for us a little bit what your concerns are um, and uh, maybe bound them in, in terms of um, what's a reasonably rosy but realistic scenario given the declining political will and what's your biggest fear? Last year, um, obviously we have to keep in mind that there's many, many positive sides to elections and people are very excited about it, but obviously there's, there's trepidation when change happens. Um, we're going to have obviously two sets of elections at the leadership level and then at the uh, parliamentary level as well eventually. Um, in the last year, this compounded with 2014 and the possibility of pullout. Uh, you've already started seeing a lot of local organizations which are less likely to engage the matter of extremism directly. So it's very hard in the last, let's say, 8 to 12 months to name names anymore because there's an uncertainty about which names may be out there after the elections. And God forbid, if there is any further conflicts that emerge, you may have retaliation um, after the fact. Um, then, of course, there's the simple issue of um, the correlation between funding, uh, troop presence, um, elections as well, and that obviously people have started to feel that, in fact, almost for the last 24 months. Uh, you have a lot of CSOs who have been in this, in this mode, drawing down a lot of their operations. Um, at the same time, uh, well, again, we'd like to be positive about it. Um, we do have faith that there will be members of the international community who, especially after the Tokyo commitments, will devote um, a substantial portion or a good portion of the 16 billion towards these kind of objectives. Um, in the end, I guess what I need to, what, I, what I'm trying to say here is that it's not a, it's not a, a multi-trillion dollar enterprise engaging civil society. Um, you don't necessarily need uh, budgets of countries. You don't need necessarily need to go into a deficit situation to solve this problem. It's just some smart maneuvers and using money wisely. I'd also, I'd also like to call attention to the, um, the importance of the countering violent extremism portfolio for the U.S. government. So um, I had one U.S. official tell me, he, he said it's about to go stratospheric. Um, the, with the $200 million global fund created by donor countries, um, with the United States involved, the Global Counterterrorism Forum, the creation of the Hadaya Center in UAE, um, I think the issue of um, building resilience against militancy in Afghanistan will continue to be important. It'll, comp it'll continue to be an important U.S. national security interest. And so um, it's, it, it was important for us to um, have people realize that the, um, the religious leader engagement is such an important part of the CVE portfolio and hoping that we'll continue that investment um, going forward. Great, thanks. As well. um, uh, please wait until I call on you um, and until the microphone gets, uh, gets to you. Um, and uh, please identify yourself and keep your question short. George Nicholson, a policy consultant for counterterrorism and special operations. You alluded to it, uh, Bob, in your last an answering the question. But I look back what happened to us in Vietnam. We pulled out, but we said, we'll go ahead and we'll provide all the logistics support and funding for the national security forces. Two years later, Congress said, pox me in your house and cut off all the funding. You can talk about, you know, this isn't that expensive an enterprise, but all your recommendations have to operate under your security umbrella. And my concern is, and maybe you can talk to it more, that what's happened in the past of the American public and Congress saying, What's the national interest of this? And if you pull out that kind of support, then how critical are all your recommendations having to operate under security uh, blanket, whether it be ISAF 
or now the, uh, the Afghan security. You know, and Thanks, George. This issue actually comes up quite a bit, and I, um, I'd like to say that our, our researchers, they went without, with absolutely no security. So um, I, I understand the importance of building a road and bringing like a tractor from Japan and, and all of those pieces that require a military convoy to, uh, to execute. Um, the kind of projects we're talking about do not require security. So these are small local initiatives at building up a Hanukkah social welfare capacity, um, building up uh, a imam training program. And these don't require a lot of security because internally amongst um, community members, they don't need security against one another. So it's only the... <laughs> It's only the influx of foreigners that somehow brings a very, very serious um, security component. I mean, that's my impression. I don't know if you guys have. If I can just add something, yeah. we have models on the ground of groups that have really functioned very well under under difficult security situations. With no um, security. With with very little security, yeah. Islamic Relief is one of them, um, uh, and uh, uh, so you will have these groups, which are actually, I mean, they will approach a community, and you will have communities where it's very difficult to differentiate between who may be pro-state, anti-state, Taliban, anti-Taliban, and then really in those gray spaces in between. Um, but there are certain needs which I think a lot of communities share, and this is really where the building blocks uh, uh, emerge. I mean, this is, this is conventional wisdom in development, right? I mean, I think a lot of development specialists will, will tell you that this is really how you go about dealing with conflict zones. Um, but uh, I think, first of all, we should put aside, I mean, we should keep the fear and the security element I mean, in, ch in check. We have to be realistic. Uh, but at the same time, we should realize that there are whole areas that we can work in without, again, these tractors and, and huge military installations. Okay. Let's get another question. Um, gentleman on the side, please. Hi, I'm uh, Dennis Scotch. I'm a consultant for LMI, Logistics Management Institute, and a veteran of the U.S. Foreign Service. Um, the, the buzzword now in Washington policy circles that deal with uh, foreign operations of this type, of, of the type in Afghanistan, is uh, partnering. And uh, I'm not at all cynical about that. I think that's a, that's a good concept to work toward. Partnering. Collaborating. Uh, well, uh, now, it seems to me there's a, there's a dilemma, and I'd like your thoughts about it. And, and the dilemma is this. If you, if you partner, then, then, of course, you play into the uh, concern that um, what you're doing is, is a foreign manipulated uh, process. And if you don't, then some of the, some of the drawbacks that local institutions have, uh, funding, institutional sophistication or development, um, w work to limit their effectiveness. So, so how, uh, you referred to a few examples of partnering, USAID, USIP. How do you, how do you uh, kind of uh, work within that uh, dilemma, if it may be called that? Okay. Thank you, sir. Um, I think this really boils down to certain issues of cultural competency. Um, when we talk about these uh, various programs across, in fact, let's say across the world where you're having problems of extremism, um, our philosophy is that local groups on the ground have been dealing with the problem of radicalization and extremism a lot harder and a lot longer than we have. We found this in Pakistan as well, uh, where you have local communities who actually then face the fire of radicalization. I mean, they're the ones who the recruitment comes out of. We've seen this in Afghanistan. We've seen this in other parts of the Muslim world. And they have certain answers. Now, the answers are not perfect. The answers are not comprehensive. They're not the complete perfect answers that we're looking for. But they have answers that they can actually, that they want some support on. And then one can offer them certain institutional support to make those answers more proactive and more effective. So there are many ways of actually creating change on the ground without having the, the stamp of your respective foreign government. Uh, and I think a lot of groups have done that. And I, this is actually something we have seen internationally uh, that in uh, many cases, the U US government and various agencies have or let me put it the other way around. We see fantastic projects that you know, reek of being local projects. Um, and later on, you know, uh, it, it's determined that it's funded by USCID or funded by this or funded by that. So it is possible. It's, it's not an unsurmountable obstacle. Uh, um, 
And I, look, for example, oh, sorry. Uh, a simple example, one of the schools in, in Pakistan is, has a network of schools, has asked us, you know, we are competing with the, um, you know, Gulf-funded extremist schools. We don't have modern resources. We need textbooks. Can you give us math and science textbooks? I mean, that's not, it has nothing to do with the, you know, U.S. government stamp or seal on a project. It's just helping them to compete against the resources of well-funded extremist groups. So little micro projects like that that can have um, a tremendous impact on their ability um, to keep and maintain students, for example. Uh, broader observation just um, globally from conflict and, and looking at subnational governance and subnational conflict worldwide, um, if, if there is a community in the middle of Afghanistan, um, and the people live, who live in that community are still alive despite 40 years of war, it means they've figured something out. <laughs> um, and what they've figured out has always been an underutilized resource in the international community. Um, and so it's something that's worth paying attention to. Next question, please. Sir. Thank you very much. Um, Najib Sharifi with a Kabul based think tank uh, called Afghanistan Analysis and Awareness. I have um, two questions. One is, um, uh, well, uh, at the same time that we have these uh, uh, good activities, uh, we've got also groups like Hizb al Tahrir and Jamiat Isla who are relentlessly working to radicalize the population. They have been very, they have been successful to some extent. Um, uh, did you uh, go over their methods of uh, activities and radicalization in uh, your um, study as well? And my second question is, uh, considering the importance um, of the interventions with regards to engaging the uh, uh, civil society networks and religious leaders, uh, and this particularly becomes important considering the fact that we have such a rich um, uh, religious cultural uh, foundation in Afghanistan for that, considering the fact that Sufi Islam has been historically, uh, Afghanistan has been a big uh, place. So why has the Afghan government and the international community has failed to tap into uh, this uh, opportunity because extremism is, well, Afghanistan is in the front line, but it's the growing threat to the security of the whole world. Thank you. I <laughs> Conspiracy theory aside, um, we, I've heard a number of, of, of responses to that question. You know, why aren't we um, utilizing these various um, groups against um, against this threat and why can't we position ourselves better? Why don't we vet the partners? Why don't we rely on people with shared values? And we make this point, I've been making this point for decades. Um, but what a, lot, what a lot of people, uh, what I've heard the response is, we're not gonna pick a good Islam. We won't pick the right Islam or the right actors. Um, and so, for some reason, that translates into, it's not our place we're not gonna. We're not gonna make decisions based on the ideological or the theological position of our potential stakeholders. And so, and I, I, I grapple with this. I pontificate on this issue quite often, thinking that is it because um, a lot of these people don't understand the power of theology or religion in these countries? Like they don't understand that this is an integral part of these stakeholders. Or is it because they don't want it to be an integral part of the stakeholders? Or is it sincerely not wanting to be in the middle of this issue? So I can't, I can't really say which, if not all three of those reasons are, there, are a factor. Um, but I'm inclined to think that it, it can't go on indefinitely. Um, as I mentioned, you know, CVE is about to go stratospheric. Um, the whole world is taking on this issue. Even the Saudis are developing a counter-radicalization program. So I don't think this issue is going to go away. And we may see some development or movement towards you know, developing a, what exactly is violent extremism in the Muslim context and what are the solutions to it ideologically and theologically. You know, my program studied this, this, this issue about how the United States engages with religion oh. uh, globally for a, a number of years. Um, uh, we, we put out a report about a year and a half ago and the, as the, the final bit of that program. Um, and, you know, why we, we asked 
agencies throughout the U.S. government, you know, why don't we really engage with this issue? And a lot of it is they, they um, part is the Establishment Clause um, of the Constitution. They're not really sure if they're allowed to promote religion. Often. They're not sure if they're allowed um, to, to get involved in these issues. Um, and um, I have been hearing that, that there's still a reluctance even today. Um, this is something we've been uh, looking at for about eight years now. Very happy to see that within the, the Bureau of Conflict Stabilization Operations, they're taking this exact issue on pretty strongly, which I'm very happy to see. Um, I think we have time for one or two more questions. I think uh, Jim in the back. I'm Jim Shear, formerly uh, Office of the Secretary of Defense. Thank you, Bob, and panelists for a very interesting uh, discussion. Uh, a non-stratospheric question. How does how do efforts to counter violent extremism, CSO-led, uh, not the conflict and stabilization ops, but civil society organizations, um, how are those efforts facilitated or made more complicated in Afghanistan, especially in the South, by uh, efforts to counter poppy cultivation, counter narcotics, that whole issue on the other side, uh, which uh, a lot of us worry about. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, uh, do you wanna... uh, it's, uh, yes, they are complicated. Uh, I think that, that uh, um, goes without saying. I think this really boils down to the fact that, uh, uh, as Marine was alluding to, there are obviously several, uh, this pro problem of radicalization and violent extremism in the Afghanistan case is, uh, is really a confluence of different factors, right? So on one hand, you've got groups um, in which are ideologically driven, your Hizbut Tahrirs that you were alluding to. Um, and I think a lot of religious scholars in Afghanistan know very well who these people are and that it's a very foreign ideology. So there's your ideological component. And then, of course, uh, you know, you've got Arbaqis in, in, in Kunduz, which are basically militias, which are uh, supposed to be maybe helping out local communities, but maybe causing trouble. Obviously, uh, drug money comes into the whole picture. So um, I guess uh, maybe this is a cop-out answer, but yes, I think you're absolutely right. The opium production does complicate everything because there are a lot more, let's see, beneficiaries from the violence. Um, and then occasionally, of course, one of the things that we saw was that certain forms of violence uh, get covered up by other forms of criminality and violence. So you're not exactly sure which is the chicken, which is the egg, which came first, and then they feed upon each other. And this essentially makes it very difficult for civil society organizations which are trying to pinpoint what the problem is and where it begins and then get to the source of it. So um, just another point to consider is that often when we used to engage groups, and just to quickly also respond to your question, um, our, our interviews would usually try to lay the ideological groundwork first, understand what kind of groups are, are, uh, at, um, are involved in the, these issues. Um, and then uh, when it comes to the issue of extremism, because there are so many different factors and actors at play here, um, one of the interesting ways that we were able to pull data was to ask communities, okay, well, how do you prevent militancy? How do you prevent drug abuse in your communities? Because that was really seen as a gateway towards other forms of violent extremism. Um, so utilizing the, the uh, drug reduction campaigns can really be an excellent inroads to addressing the CBE issue. And um, Hedja, I'd like to give you the, the final word for the day. Oh. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you all for coming, and I, I hope the... Uh, actually, please turn on your microphone. I keep doing that. I keep turning it off because I don't want to... Uh, I, I hope the report will be a, use, uh, a useful tool for those of you um, in government or with aid organizations um, that are involved in CVE work or involved in Afghanistan, and we would like you to reach out to us if we could be of assistance any further. Uh, we've been... Um, working very closely with a number of these groups, so we're happy to facilitate um, relationships or partnerships between these groups, um, and we look forward to the continuing investment in the Afghan people. Thank you. So um, our programs work on uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, South Asia, and um, other issues related to conflict um, is at c3.csis.org, um, at worde.org. Presumably, you can find the, uh, this yes. report and, um, and others, including um, some work that they've done in Pakistan and, and, and other places. Um, I would like to thank um, all of you today for coming. Thank you, Robert. Um, and thank all of you. And please give a, um, give a hand to Word.